We have been looking now in somewhat of a mini-series, I've called it, in the series of Colossians of the Christian home. We've been looking at reciprocal pairs that Paul is teaching or speaking to and giving responsibilities. We looked first at the responsibility of wives to husbands in verse 18 and then husbands to their wives in verse 19. Now we turn to verse 20 and 21 and look at children and parents. Children and parents. Verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things. Why? For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not. Do not stir up, do not stimulate, do not excite, do not bring about anger, lest they be discouraged, disheartened, dispirited. What I would say is zap the life out of them. So this morning we're going to hear what God first directly speaks to children. Now children, if you've ever felt overlooked in a service, that was certainly not intentional. But here God is specifically going to address you. And that assumes, the presupposition is that he's speaking to children that can understand what it means to obey. Understand what it means to please God and that they understand who the Lord is. Right? So Paul is obviously not addressing a six-month-old because he's talking directly to children, not to fathers and mothers to, to explain this, the presupposition they already have. And so he's speaking directly to children. So first of all, before we look at this command, who's a child? Right? Everybody in here is, fits the description. If you're alive, you're a child of, of some parents, uh, and so, who is Paul addressing? Well, first of all, he's addressing those that are still under parental authority. Now, having said that, we understand a vast difference in a five-year-old under authority and a 20-year-old college student under authority. But there are still obligations of any child living at home, regardless of age, to recognize and to honor parental authority. Not in the same way a five-year-old has to do. A five-year-old is going to be given commands routinely, regularly, daily. What to do, when to do it, it's a command and control kind of environment at that immature age. But the expectation of a 20-year-old college student is they've grown to maturity and they're responsible, which means they're able to respond. So the need for commands is gone, basically, right? They know how to contribute to the household. They go about doing responsible things without ever being commanded again is the expectation of maturity. So if you're in that age bracket, be mature and respond, but know that also living under parental authority means there are things and expectations that have to be worked out in wisdom with young adults under biblical parental authority than immature children which are still at an early age. And that parental authority, Paul would say, needs to be honored. Honored. Probably not in the form of commands, maybe in the form of request. Could you do this? Would you do this? Because here you're talking to an adult and not a child who's responsible and who can respond. So whatever range you're in in the relationship with your parents, primarily, Paul, we're going to be dressing the the younger ages where the scope is everything, Children obey your your parents in everything uh, because this is well-pleasing to the Lord. So I hope you can pick out where you fit in this message and whether you're a young adult at home still or whether you're not a young adult and you're under authority where God expects you to respect, submit, and to follow those commands of your parents. So first, the command. Children, obey. The word obey means to hearken, to listen, to submit. It's a compound word, which is hupa, which is come under, and akuo means to listen. 
So come under and listen to what the parents are commanding. Because if there's obedience, then there are commands, there's instruction, there are things being told with the expectation from God that you're coming under that loving biblical authority. Not based on the performance of the parents, but based on what is well-pleasing to God. As you know, children, if you're old enough, your parents are sinners. They don't get everything right. So the motivating factor here is not performance. It's Jesus, who's your Lord. Jesus, God, who is pleased with obedience. But when you look at this word in other contexts, we'll look at about four contexts, something begins to emerge in this word that is often overlooked today among parents and children. So first of all, we see this in Acts 12, 13, where Rhoda is in the house with the church. They're meeting there for prayer because Peter's in prison. He's going to be executed at daylight. But an angel of the Lord comes into the prison, wakes up Peter, who's in chains. The chains fall off. Peter makes his way through the first ward, the second ward, and into the city. And then he recognizes as the angel disappears, the Lord has delivered him out of the hand of Herod. So naturally, he goes to the place where they're praying, and he knocks on the gate. And Rhoda hearkens. That's the same Greek word for obey. She hearkens, and then what? She obeys, and she, she goes and sees who's at the gate. Now hold on to that. Matthew eight twenty seven. Jesus has entered into a ship, and the disciples are following him. And while he's on the ship, he goes to sleep. And a great tempest arises, and his disciples are very fearful, and they come to the Lord and wake him up and say, Lord, save us, we're perishing. And Jesus says, why are you so fearful? Oh, you have little faith. He gets up, and he rebukes the winds and the sea, and they obey him. In fact, they marvel and says, what what manner of authority is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? He rebuked the sea, and there was a great calm. All right, hang on to that. Mark one twenty seven. Jesus is in a synagogue and there's a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. And the spirit cries out and says, we know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. Have you come to destroy us? And Jesus rebukes the unclean spirit and says, hold your peace, come out of him. And the spirit obeys He yells out with a loud voice, convulses the man, and he comes out of the man. And they are astonished. What new doctrine is this? What what authority is this that even the unclean spirits obey him? Hearken, listen. Hupakuo is the word. Same word in Colossians 3.20. And then finally in Hebrews 11.8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he would act receive as an inheritance, he obeyed going out not knowing whither he went. Right, now the thing I want to call your attention to that's often overlooked when it comes to obedience is the fact that Jesus didn't have to say it twice. Rhoda heard it and she immediately went. And when Abraham heard the call of God in Genesis 12, now of course he had to go home and tell Sarah and probably pack the bags and get all his belongings, but he immediately responded to the voice with obedience. So children, if you're old enough to hear and understand and know who the Lord is, to obey your parents doesn't mean the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time or the sixth time they tell you to do it. It means to hearken and to listen on the first time because a delayed obedience by definition is what? It's not obedience, right? A a non-responsive child is saying what? I will be the authority. I heard what you said. Now, the the, the supposition is that it was a clear command and, and you did hear it. And of course, be careful with that one, right? I didn't hear you. You could whisper, how about a bowl of ice cream? Oh, yeah, okay, I heard that. I just didn't hear you say, 
go clean my room or, or do something like that. So be careful not hearing. But if you, you clearly heard you were in earshot and the command wasn't impossible, you know, go get the mail and you better get it in five seconds. Oh, okay, I can't do that. That's impossible. But assuming it's possible, you heard it, the expectation that God lays on you directly, children, is that you obey on the first command because the delay means I will be the authority of my life and I will determine when and on what command I will decide to respond and to hearken to my parents. So children, I want to encourage you. You're a sinner too. You're not perfect. And there's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And your obedience will never save you. Yet, God expects you to come under the authority of your parents with a first-time kind of obedience because that is going to equip you with coming under the Lordship of Christ because what does He expect? Did God have to say to Abraham, Abraham, I've told you now three or four times. And yes, if truth be known, there are times when we have to go back to Scripture and we've ignored, we've rebelled, we've disobeyed a third and fourth time. All of us fit that criteria. But all of us must agree that when God commands us, unless there's something we have to work through, some detail that's going to make it challenging that involves other people, He expects us to, to heed it and to begin and move in the direction of obedience. As Abraham did when God told him to go take your only begotten son, your only son, and offer him on the mountain, I will tell you, he got up early the next morning. See, he's moving already toward obedience. The actual act which God spared him from would be three days later on the mount he showed him that he had to travel to, but on the first day he's moving in the direction of obedience. And so children... God is calling you to respond obediently, to respond on the first time. And then when you don't, we need to understand that God then wants you to seek His forgiveness because this is what obedience is in the Bible, just as a parent would need to seek forgiveness from God in our disobedience when we clearly reject, we clearly delay, and we don't follow a clear command of God. Scripture. So obedience is something that God expects on the first command. You find this also in Ephesians 6 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may go well with thee, and that your life may be long on the earth. Paul takes the fifth commandment which is concerning Israel and a specific land called Canaan. And it's the first commandment where there was a promise annexed to it. Okay. Now, some things about that promise. One is that it's an incidental motivation, not the primary. It's a secondary motivation, not the primary. What's the primary? This is well-pleasing to God. This is right to God. There's your motivation. Incidentally, Here's an effect that will go well with you and your life will be long on the earth. Second thing we need to consider, it didn't go well with Jesus Christ, neither did he live long on the earth. The perfect Son of God obeyed his parents perfectly, yet it did not go well with him. Prosperous is the word there. He, he laid his head out in the Garden of Gethsemane, didn't have any money, but he worked harder than any man we ever have ever known. And he, he died at 33. He lived a very short life. So we've got to consider that. Next, the mortality rate for children up to 10 years old at Ephesus was 39 to 50%. Surely some of those 10-year-olds obeyed their parents, especially among the Jews because they were taught to. They obeyed their parents. Number three, the early church didn't prosper, did it? Because of persecution, they lost land, they lost houses, they lost livelihood, and some of them were cut down at an early age. And then finally, we have to consider the promise is connected with obedience to parents. That's a relationship. So in general, when you follow the wisdom of those that God has placed over you to care for you, like the book of Proverbs tells us, in general, it will be well with you, and in general... 
You'll live a long life because you won't go against the wise things they've told you from the Word of God and warnings that could cut your life short or that could mean that you wouldn't live a life that would go well with you. Proverbs 15.5, The fool despises his father's instruction, but he that regardeth instruction is prudent. Despise your father's instruction, despise his warnings, despise... All that he's taught you, it's not going to go well with you in general, and your life could be cut short. Think of a person I was talking to recently, a mother who's speaking of her son that's an engineer. He's a, a Christian young man in a small company, and he's, he's advancing. And the owner wants to put him in a position of taking over the company at a young age. And I thought, well, that must be a smart engineer. And she said, well, no. I didn't verbalize that, but she, she answered my question without asking it. She said, no, he recognizes his integrity. It's got nothing to do with his smartness. I say, I say nothing. Obviously, if he couldn't run the company at all, he wouldn't be in that position. But it's his integrity, his honesty that he'd been taught from his parents that's now producing things that are going well from him. And so this is not a promise of guarantee that if you follow your parents' instruction... Your life will be long, guaranteed, and that you will prosper, guaranteed. But in general, the book of Proverbs says it will go well with you, and you will prosper, and you'll live long on the earth, in general. And so, how does Paul say this should happen? Honor your father and mother. means to fix the value, to estimate, like you would... Fix the value of your house, or you would do an estimate on it. What's the value? And so the idea here is not valuing your parents because they're always honorable. On any given day, we as parents could show that there are times we're not acting so honorable, right? And children, you're going to be the first to see that in action. You're going to hear sinful words at times and see sinful attitudes in parents. And so the basis of honoring your parents is not because they're always so honorable and they always say the right thing. And dad is always so wise and he always is so gentle and she always just says it the right way. No, that's not the basis. It's because of the value of Jesus Christ. It's the value of God. It's why we want to come under whatever authority God commands us to come under. It's not because of the value of our government and because our our Congress is so honorable and, and men and women of integrity all the time or some of the time. It's because our Savior has commanded us to put to silence those who would speak evil of us by doing well and coming under that authority to the glory and honor of God. So children, I want to commend you and encourage you and to stay the course while you're under parental authority to honor them and to fix the value and give them honor because of the value of Christ and come under that loving authority even when on a day it may not look so loving, the tone may not be so loving because even parents need to regularly and routinely seek forgiveness and repent in a Christian home. See, a Christian home is not a home that's perfect. It's a home where the family knows where to go to get the instruction for life, the Bible, and then how to follow that instruction to the glory of God which with much repentance, much need for Christ, and much acknowledging the Lordship of Christ in the family home. Now, I want to talk about a presupposition here based on the reality that Paul is speaking directly to the children to obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And what is the supposition? How do they know what obedience is? How do they know? How did they get to the place? Because obviously if Paul is demanding it of the children, it's possible. Obedience is possible, or he wouldn't make the command. It's because the parents have taught them what it means to obey. And they've instructed them in obedience and who the Lord is. See, the presupposition is that Paul now is not just talking to children. He's talking to the parents. Because a one-year-old 
doesn't know what that means. So instruction to children, now we transition to instruction for parents to train children in obedience on the first time. Right? See, parents, you're training your children on the second time and the third time and the fourth time and the fifth time and the sixth time and the seventh time. You're training them. But dad doesn't really mean this. And then you're discouraging them because you're going to be inconsistent. Because you can't remember yesterday if it was the eighth time or the twelfth time. And so, how's dad going to do it today? His standard is just inconsistent. Yesterday, it was the second time. The day before, it was the first time. Then it was the tenth time. I'm so discouraged. So, dads and, and moms... We need to instruct our children what obedience is and we need to follow the pattern of what God says obedience is. Understanding that your children are not born with a natural bent to submit, just like you were not. Your, your children are not thinking, my, my dad, I just can't, I'm just so thankful to have my dad. He's superb. He always gets it right. He always says it the right way. I mean, there's nothing more I want to do than when he commands just to do everything he says. That two-year-old doesn't think that way, right? We know that. So the only way a child could get to the place to obey the instruction of verse 20 is that the parents have taught them what it means to obey and have required it in the home. Ye fathers, Ephesians 6, 4. Provoke not your children to wrath. There in Ephesians 6, 4. The counterpart of provocation to wrath is, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now the word bring up means to nourish, cultivate, develop up to maturity. Now, there could be all kinds of ideas in this room about how to do that. In the world, there's many books, many ideas, but Paul gives us two words to settle the issue. Bring them up. Raise them up to maturity through nurture and admonition. Nurture is the word padaya, which is the uh, translated often in the Bible, chastisement. Now, when we use that word, we only think of the negative side of it. But this word in the Bible means both positive and negative. To chasten your children means first, instruction in virtue. You're going to instruct them in Scripture, in virtue, in morality, as God says what that morality is. I think of 2 Peter 1.3. According as His divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him that called us to glory and virtue. And then He starts giving virtuous living. So your parenting doesn't save anybody. Aren't you glad to know that? But it does instill virtue. And it communicates and illustrates and instructs and and gives an example of virtuous living. An example of virtuous living that includes repentance and acknowledgement and confession. Sometimes we think that's not virtue. That's Godliness, because godliness will require acknowledgement of sin and growth and sanctification. And so the positive side of chastisement or chastening is instruction and virtue. The negative side is disciplinary correction. Reproofs, rebukes, and yes, the word that we use is called spanking or the rod of correction. Not a pleasant thing. Not a thing I would have thought of, but a thing that God in His ancient, infinite wisdom, has given us as a tool to bring them up to maturity. Because if maturity is to be able to respond in wisdom and make God-honoring decisions, or decisions in general, we'll just say, it requires a child to curb or resist passion and desires. And the one song that's at the top of the top 40 list of your child is this by Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. Present tense, I'll do it my way. Every time they cry in anger, they scream at you, they say no, or they say I'm not going to do that. You know what they're saying and communicating clearly because as a parent you understand something about your child. They are saying I'm not going to do it because it gives me no pleasure. 
no pleasure. And God has placed you in their lives to go against the grain and to curb their passions so that they don't grow up like this current generation. And what is the mantra they're living by? Oh, I'm going to do it my way. And if you get in my way, I'll vandalize your property. And I'll do things worse than that. The sign, according to Paul, of perilous times in the last days, which were beginning in Apostle Paul's day, they were starting with Timothy, because he instructed Timothy in the church. Timothy, this is happening now, and it's going to keep going, is that men shall be lovers of pleasures, lovers of themselves, disobedient to parents. Why? Because the parents didn't push back on their love of pleasure with the rod of correction. They just picked them up and tried to control them, restrain them, and they didn't require obedience to a command. See, we understand from Scripture that a child is not going to naturally respond to a command. The thing that starts to impart wisdom is the rod of correction that God has given you. Lovingly, gently, not in anger, that disheartens the child. But nevertheless, to be done. So let's look at just a few of those well-known passages again so we can understand that when Paul says, children obey your parents, he is saying in a way that does not even have to be stated, parents require your children to obey. Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth the rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him. There's our word, chastening. It's a Hebrew word there. Betimes. Why is that the standard of love? I, I wouldn't agree with that naturally. The standard of love is... You chasten your child. Well, one reason, it follows the pattern of God's love. Proverbs 3.12. What is the... What does Solomon say there? I'm going I'm to turn so I won't misquote it. Verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. So the chastening of God is analogous to a father that chastens his son because he loves him. Not because he hates him. In Hebrews 12.5, you've forgotten the exhortation that speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, why? Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receives. A scourge was not a pleasant thing. Now what form, what form was the discipline taking place in the book of Hebrews? Reproaches, afflictions, and persecution. Hebrews 10. So God is correcting either chastening and correction for sin or chastening and training for advancement or growth, right? Now, the Hebrew writer assumes that every Jewish person reading his epistle was chastened by their father. Which one of you were not chastened by your father and you gave him reverence? And yet they did it after their own pleasure, which just means our best intentions, we don't have perfect knowledge. We're doing the best we can. And sometimes we back up and say, mm, that was probably a time I should have done more, or maybe did a little too much. But He, God, for our profit, that we may be partakers of His holiness. So, to love your child and to use the rod of correction is to follow the pattern of God's love. Because God is not going to leave you to your own desires, to go your own way and to live life according to the song, I'll do it my way. He's coming with His own way of correction to bring about obedience. Aren't you glad that God loves you that way? 
when you love your children as difficult and as challenging as it is, it communicates the love of God because love is a willing sacrifice for the good of another. My unwillingness to sacrifice could be the love of myself. It's just too difficult. It's too challenging. Maybe it won't work. And so we rely on the wisdom of God. And we want to follow God's wisdom in curbing passions that will rule the child. And even upon a child coming to faith, those passions will still have to be dealt with. Passions that have been ingrained and settled in that nature because perhaps a parent was indulgent and let them go without proper correction. But he chastens him betimes. Betimes has a few nuances. One is early. Early. David said in Psalm 63, O God, thou art my guard, early will I seek thee. So it can mean early in the beginning of something. When How early should you start? <clears throat> well, probably about the time when your child needs a command to stop, no, don't touch that, don't do that. You don't say that to a three-month-old. You don't say it to a six-month-old. When that child starts moving around, what's happening? You start saying, no, stop, don't do that. Now is the time to start inflicting some gentle discomfort. That gives wisdom, be times. So this is not something you wait till they're two or three or four. It's something when the command is necessary now, there's a time to start thinking about giving a little discomfort in an appropriate, loving way that is not harming the child. If you beat him with the rod, Solomon says, he will not die. Oh, that, don't say that out loud. It just means to use the rod. Beat there is not like the connotation we think of, of pummeling someone. Just use it, strike, use the rod. He's not going to die. It doesn't say it's not going to hurt. It just You won't be injuring the child when you do it correctly and lovingly as God would tell us to do. Be times is promptly and diligently. Promptly means right away. How much of our challenges exist in parenting because we're so inconsistent? I wish I could tell you well, I was consistent, but can't tell you that, right? And sometimes that produces some of the struggle. See, promptly means when it's clearly an occasion where dad and mom have agreed this is disobedience and this is what need to follow, then every single time that happens, every single time, unless circumstances say otherwise, we're going to administer the correction. Every single time, because the child knows this is the standard, you rebelled against dad's clear command, you understood it, you heard it, you decided to move forward, and therefore consistent. So betimes means promptly, diligently, which means takes effort. And that's part of the problem, isn't it? Dad, when you get home, get up out of the chair and put your phone down and address your children. <clears throat> well, I need to tell myself that too. You know, you're just tired and you just kicked back, and you just started checking some of the news for the day, and there he comes, just at the wrong time, as if there's some good time for him to, you know, son, I want you to disobey at this time of the day, because here I'm reading and I'm, I'm taking it easy. So get up diligently, promptly, with effort, and move out lovingly, and do the task of parenting. Now, beloved, you know parenting is a hard thing. Oh, how challenging and difficult. And I'm convinced part of the reason is, is it drives us back to Jesus Christ. Lord, I, I, can't, I can't be a parent. Now, when I was first a parent, I thought, well, I can do this. <laughs> you know, I can, I can do this. It didn't take long. So I can't do this. I cannot do this. 
drives us back to God for our help and our strength because that's where He wants us to go. So early, promptly, diligently, painstakingly is in the word betimes. It's painstaking, isn't it? Because you realize for the young tyke, I did have to tell you. Yeah. I told you and five minutes later after I administered a discipline, he did it again. What, what, what's going on? We know what's going on. See? When you ask those why questions that you can answer from the Bible, don't, man, don't ask those questions. We know what's going on in the soul of that child. He wants it his way. She wants it her way. And her rebellion coming out or his in no, in fits, in tantrums, in all that they do is communicating, I will not do it your way. So parents... Know your children. Know that cry. Is it just manipulation? Is it tears of anger? I remember the first time I discovered that. Of course, I look back at my own life, and I was old enough to remember when I was just crying out of fury that I didn't get my way. Right? So Know your children, and know that their number one desire is to get what they want and to be the king of their own kingdom. That's why they say no to the vegetables. We get that. I demand chicken nuggets, and after that, I want Sour Patch Kids. I don't want one. I want ten. And however it may go. And you're the, you're the parents that's put there by God to push back on passions that the proverb says are bound in their heart. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. What is foolishness? Folly. What is folly? It's the opposite of wisdom in Proverbs. What is that? Prudence and wisdom is the ability to carefully make judgments and decisions. All right? What's keeping a child from making good judgments? Passion. That's what's ruling the child. Passion. So to bring a child up to maturity by nurture, positive instruction, negative disciplinary action, is going to require that their, those passions are starting to be subdued. And your words are not going to subdue them alone. Now, honey, honey, we shouldn't feel that way. We shouldn't think that way. That's the way they're bent. That's the way they're wired. So if foolishness is bound, it's tied up in the heart of a child, God says, here's how you start untangling the knots. The rod of correction will start driving the child who will make every decision on passion alone, just like our current culture, where they'll move up to maturity where they can make good judgments. Now that can happen whether a child's saved or not. Just good judgments. Am I going to act on what I want and drive up $100,000 in debt? Why? That's what I want. Or am I going to say, mm, that's, not a good idea. that's not a good judgment. See, this is what the rod helps produce. Helps curb passion. Think about Paul's illustration of spiritual immaturity in Ephesians chapter 4. He would say, To we all come to the union of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect, mature man, according to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So spiritual maturity happens through the knowledge of Christ. He's the measure. He's the stature. Now, what's the aim of that goal? So there were no more children. Now, here's what Paul is doing. He's looking at spiritual immaturity by giving us a picture of physical childish immaturity. And what does he say it is? Be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, by the cunning craftiness of men who lie in wait to deceive. All right. Spiritual immaturity is a person who's not being mature in Christ. And so what happens? Any wind of doctrine that promises... To satisfy their passions, they are locked in. Just like a child, a three-year-old, when you lay before him an old, crinkled, faded $100 bill and a pile of 100 shiny pennies, large stack, shiny. Which one does he take? The pennies every time. Because passion and bent is suggesting that will give me the greater pleasure than this green, faded, wrinkled piece of paper. 
So he follows his passion. So Paul uses a spiritual illustration based on a child's immaturity. Right? And so how, how does a parent start to drive it far from them? By teaching them obedience. What does it mean to obey? And the rod is associated with that wisdom. So then in Proverbs twenty two fifteen, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. So the rod and reproof is giving that prudence. It's helping the child gain the ability to make good judgments. Not perfection, just good judgments. How does the rod and reproof do that? Because it is helping the child move to maturity so that they cannot act on every whim and passion. Now, as adults, we can still struggle with that, right? You ever make a decision that you just wanted it so bad and look back and say, that was such a bad decision. Now, imagine a person that lives their whole life that way. It's just all about me, all about my passions. So a child left to himself means to send away, to dismiss, brings his mother to shame. To dismiss means to not consider something worthy of consideration. What are you not considering worthy? His disobedience. So you dismiss it and you send him away and you don't address the disobedience and it doesn't get better. It gets worse. Now what are the reasons that you and I and if you're past parenting and you were a parent, you probably still can identify to this. What are the reasons we dismiss <clears throat> our children? Well, one is, again, the, the, the challenge of it, the difficulty. Again? I'm exhausted. It takes effort. <clears throat> I've got to get up again? You know? I was right in the middle of a project. <clears throat> As if the project takes more precedent than your child's soul and their good. And then there's, I need some social media time. I've got shopping online to do. I've got activities to do. I've got places to go. But your children need that instruction, that correction. And so we often dismiss a child's dis disobedience, not because we don't recognize it every time, we just are putting other things as a priority in its place. And so this is not a call to be abusive and mean-spirited and critical. That would dishearten the child. It's a call to lovingly require obedience and teach it because God now, speaking to the children, says what? Children, obey your parents the first time, not the tenth time, which presupposes parents are teaching first-time obedience. And, and be sure it's not going to happen because you teach it. It's going to happen because you consistently apply God's methods and God's means to bring about obedience, not perfectly, but in a way that can happen, or I don't know how to make sense of this verse. You know, all the children are going, we know Paul is not real here. We know <clears throat> this can't be accomplished. Well, the idea is that it, it can be. Not the salvation of your children through your reproof. Not the salvation of your children through your parenting. Not the salvation of your children through discipline. But the obedience and submission of your children that comes through parents teaching their children to obey. Chasten thy son while there is hope, which suggests what? You only have a short window. And then hope for that is gone. Chasten your son while there's hope. <clears throat> and he'll give rest to your soul. There'll be some rest there, right? Not, not totally and fully, but the rest that you didn't have and all the effort and challenges that's required in being consistent when you had to get up 30 times or whatever it was, that begins to back off because the child is learning submission. And yes, some children take a lot longer, don't they? Strong-willed some, it seems like it takes very little effort and they're starting to comply. Others, it takes a lot more. I was one of those that took a lot more. and Maybe you were too. But God expects us to lovingly apply His Word 
with nurture and admonition, calling to attention is admonition. We're calling to attention what needs to change. We're calling attention to God and His Word. We're calling attention to the virtues of the Bible. And then we're chastening, which means instruction and correction with words and with the rod of correction. This is God's form of love. This is what God requires. And so this is what we as parents need to do. Now, <clears throat> children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is well-pleasing. It pleases God when you do this, children. It gives God pleasure. Now, ultimately, we know the pleasure of God in obedience is the pleasure of God in trusting Him and obeying, right? Romans 14, 23. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So there is an obedience that's not of faith, that's sin. Because it's not coming from trust in Jesus Christ. Or in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. So there is an obedience that ultimately doesn't please God because it's not coming from faith in the gospel. So now, therefore, children, I want to encourage you to believe the gospel. I want to talk directly to you. Because obedience without the gospel will give you some temporary blessings. But frankly, I'm not in it for temporary blessings. Give me eternity or give me nothing. Yeah, it may go well with you and you may prosper and you may live long, but unless it comes from faith, what have we gained if we gain the whole world and lose our own souls? We gain nothing. I'm not in it for temporal blessings. And I don't want it for you for temporal blessings. But eternity is the blessing we want. So trust in Christ and believe the gospel. And what would that mean? First of all, it means to believe the bad news about yourself. It's believing my obedience could never bring about my salvation. It's believing the bad news that I've broken God's law and I'm a sinner and I need Jesus Christ. So you don't need to be in open rebellion. You don't need to go out and live a life that is a, like the prodigal son. You don't need to have some wonderful testimony how that you were in the darkness of night and God rescued you. All you need is to understand that you're a sinner and you've broken God's law. And the fact that you are a thief of the worst kind because you've robbed God of His glory. Already you have at such a young age. You've robbed Him. The Lord says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will not give to another. And yet you've given it. You've given His glory. You've robbed God of His glory by your covetousness and your treasuring everything you've treasured in your heart above God. And therefore, you need Christ. You need the gospel. And God will be mercy to thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression. But He will by no means clear the guilty. How does God have merciful... Mercy upon people that have broken the law and then say in the same breath, I will not clear people that have broken the law. Because Christ, Christ is your substitute. Think about the cost of God's love for you. If you are to be redeemed, it cost Him His only begotten, pure, harmless Lamb of God to suffer in your room instead. For your sins and my sins and the sins of your parents and all of our God-belittling sins where we've treasured and loved anything and everything above God. And yet Christ comes and He drinks every drop of the wrath of God in the cup given Him. Gladly He obeys. Gladly He submits to His Father. Gladly He humbles Himself on your behalf with a love so rich, so deep. That's the good news of the gospel. Jesus, our substitute, bore the wrath of God. And Jesus, His righteous obedience now becomes ours. How? Not by obeying. Not by doing good, because there's none to do with good, no, not one. Not by being righteous, because there's no one that is righteous, Romans 3. We've all gone out of the way. We've all together become unprofitable. Our mouths are like an open sepulcher. We've said wrong things. We've done wrong things. We have a heart 
that's wanted wrong things. And so the way God clears the guilty with mercy, but doesn't clear the guilty, is that our guilt is laid on Christ. He becomes the guilty one on our behalf so that we may become free in Christ. So children, trust in Jesus and follow Him. And know the only fitness that God requires is to feel your need for Him. To know your sin. To know Him as your substitute. And to trust in Him for all that He is. And to follow Him the rest of your life. That's the blessing I want for you. That's the blessing your parents want. And it's for those who trust in Jesus Christ. Will you trust Him today? And then lastly, and I'll close with just a few points here. The reciprocal responsibility. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. To provoke means to bring about, to instigate something. Now they supplied the word anger likely because that's implied in the word provoke, and it's used in... Ephesians 6, 4, fathers provoke not your children to wrath. That's the actual Greek word there. But here, it's italicized. But what we need to understand about provocation is that the provocation leads to discouragement, not to anger necessarily. There can be anger in that, but it's discouragement. It's being dispirited, discouraged, or again, to to zap the life out of the child. What is it about a father in particular, and of course this is to mothers too, but it seems to be fathers in particular can have a way of requiring obedience that actually discourages the child. What would that be? Just a few. And they're not limited to what I say here. It's to command your children without the gospel. You command them without the gospel. And you make them think it's their obedience that is really what's going to do it. And sooner or later they're discouraged because they they understand, I can't do this thing. And we command them without living the gospel. We don't live it out before them. That's a discouragement. Because we we make them think that if they can just get as good as dad is, or really meet, meet the mark where dad is, perhaps they can reach the place where God would be pleased with them. That's discouraging. See, we're to teach the law in such a way that they set their hope in God, not the law, not in themselves. Psalm 78. How do you teach the law in such a way that they hope in God? You tell them they can't keep the law. You tell them their obedience will never please God. You tell them that your obedience could never please God. You tell them that Daddy can't save you. Mommy can't save you. Daddy can't save himself. It's the gospel alone that saves It's when we command our children without a relationship. You say, don't do that, do this, go there, be this, don't do that, do that, and you are removed from the child. There's no relationship. That can be easy to do with a busy life, can't it? Stop doing that, do this, daddy's busy, go there. Don't talk like that, don't speak like that, stop saying that. And there's no relationship. The law cannot produce a relationship with God. The law cannot produce love, and it will never produce it in your family. Now, there's got to be some law. God's law and our rules derive from God's law. So, what time are we going to go to bed? Well, mom and dad are going to decide that for the five-year-old. Twenty-year-old, we're going to let you make that decision now. What time are we going to get up? Are you going to do your homework or not? But you're not going to, you're going to do that. Right? But see, when your rules become the basis of the relationship, Psalm 78 says they were not steadfast in the Lord. They didn't keep His commandments because they were hoping in a law and not in God. When we give commands and there's no relationship, we discourage the young children because they just want to be with dad and mom. Yeah, I know that changes. Right? I mean, you don't want them to be 30 and still being with mom and dad. You you want them to be independent, but they just want to be with dad. Stop doing that. Do this. Be this. But you're removed relationally. That 
discourages and zaps the life out of them. Number three, commanding without peace. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you're also called in one body and be thankful. So you're not bringing peace. Now what's the opposite of peace? It's not just war and conflict. It's fear and anxiety. What parent doesn't have to struggle with fear? Right? So when you don't have the peace of God ruling your hearts and fear rules your heart, then you can be suffocating. You know, they get older and you keep controlling, you keep suffocating. It's a hard thing, isn't it, parents, to make that transition? And fear drives you often because you've put your hope in the wrong object, which at times can be your children. See? Or you put your identity in being a parent. And of course, who wants to be a bad parent? I want to be a good parent. And if my identity is being a good parent, then I want people to see me as a good parent. Oh, guess what? That means my children have to be good. (laughs) But they're not always good, so what happened? Coming down. Because there's no peace. And rather than bringing peace to your parenting, you're bringing fear, and fear is suffocating, and fear, uh, there's no love in fear, John says. Perfect love casteth out fear. And so having the wrong identity, not being in Christ, we are coming down on everybody in our relationship because our identity is attached to their performance. So if you think being a good parent means academic success, athletic success, success in business, success in every way, because my success and identity as a parent is wrapped up in my children, now you have no peace and you're coming down hard and you're laying burdens on that child that they can't carry because they weren't designed to carry. You know, Jesus lifts burdens. He doesn't lay them. He's the burden bearer. He's not the burden maker. So when we give commands, and we have no peace because we're acting out of fear, because we're getting our identity in our parent, parenting, then we, we, we bind heavy burdens We lay unreasonable expectations on our children which they were not designed to carry or even provide that expectation. And they get discouraged and disheartened because they can never measure up. They never measure up. And they never will because we're using the wrong standard. And then commands without grace. What does that mean? See, when... Paul told the church at Ephesus, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace. See, when we have peace and we're using the law in a right way, in a a lawful way and not an unlawful way because it can't produce things like love and we're using our words to minister grace, we're asking questions now. We're not saying, why did you do that? Which is communing in what? See, when you say, why did you do that? You're saying, I'd never do that. Which is not true. You're laying a burden on them. I can't believe you do that. Why not? You probably did it. And probably have some same struggles. See, we're communicating. If you could only get where I am, you'd be okay. But you can't. So we're asking questions. Lord, what are you doing in my child's life? Why have you revealed this to me when I'm working on this project? Why is it that it's happening now? Because you're wanting me to minister grace to my child. You're wanting me to come with words and correction and love that's going to help the child because you love the child. And so we're asking questions. What is God doing? What is He after? What grace does He want me to minister? Is this a time for correction with the rod or is it a time for encouragement in another direction? What is the grace that I need to be applying in the life of my children? And then finally doing so, it drives us back, as I said again, to Jesus Christ. No perfect parents, no perfect children. Parenting doesn't save. Obedience doesn't save. It brings us back to the Lord Jesus Christ. We find in Him our strength, our help, our rescue, our deliverance, our forgiveness, our all in all, Paul would say. We find it all in Christ. So, beloved... If you're not a parent yet, you likely may be. And so 
think through what God is requiring of you in terms of trusting Him. And children, I encourage you and commend you to obey your parents and to, and to, and to, to do it as unto the Lord and acknowledge when you don't. And understand that obedience doesn't save you. Turn to Christ and the gospel. And may God bless our Christian homes, not with perfection because that's not possible, but with growth in the word and love to the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We just first want to confess our sins. Those of us that uh, have been parents and we're past that stage, we can now be flooded right now with a lot of guilt. A lot of things that we did that we wish we had done differently. And so, Lord, I I pray uh, that we would find the peace in knowing forgiveness and knowing you've wiped away our guilt by the blood of Jesus Christ and let our minds be uh, readjusted uh, for future generations, whether we're grandparents or giving instruction to young parents, that our minds would be readjusted to the Word of God, that we would not use our own opinions, our own ideas, Uh, when they're contrary to God's word, your word, but we would be in line with what you say. And Lord, those that are in parenting right now, I pray give them a strength and a grace uh, in the challenges and difficulty and just the exhaustion that they are going through right now and and the great uh, pressures that they could be experiencing and how the devil wants to disrupt the Christian home. I pray for the fathers that they would be about training and devotions in the family and the home teaching the children and lovingly administering correction in a way that pleases you. And for the mothers who spend so much time with the children, give them stamina and grace, Lord, uh, to meet the the day's uh, challenges, which can be overwhelming, and bring them at times to their wit's end. And so pray, Lord, that you provide grace and may they feel your strengthening power to keep pressing on. And for the children here, Lord, pray that their eyes would be open to turn to Christ and that they would do so today. Today is the day of salvation. And I pray, Lord, that they would follow you and know their obedience doesn't save, but they would find the great joy in being obedient and pleasing you by faith, trusting in you and giving you pleasure, knowing that they're relying on your strength and not the strength of parents and how they love their parents and submit to your authority. So, Lord, make all this a reality for your glory, for your honor in a culture where the family is disintegrating, in a culture where the family is turned upside down. In a, full, in a culture where authority is no longer recognized, may the Christian home and the gospel shine bright in the church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.